an opportunity to kind of log on before we get started. So we'll get started in about uh, one more minute. Thank you, everyone. Okay, welcome everybody to the Community Technical Assistance Center Reimagining Children's Services webinar series. This is a part two. We had part one last month, and this is a, a wonderful part two on gearing up for change. Um, before we get started and introduce our speakers for today, I just want to go through um, some basic logistics about using a webinar system, especially if this is the first time that you've been on. Um, so currently, everybody will be muted. There's a number of, of people that have registered to participate, so everybody is, is currently muted. Um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please use the chat function. The chat box is on the right-hand side in that panel towards the bottom. If you do not see the chat, just click the chat icon at the top, and it'll pop up underneath participants. If you have any questions, just make sure that when you uh, submit, to click send to all panelists when you, when you send us a comment. That way all the presenters can see your question or comment. If you're having any technical issues, send a message via chat to our host, which is Brianna.gun. Uh, you can, sorry, you can send a message to the host in the dropdown or you can email Brianna at Brianna.gunsolves at nyu.edu. And just as a, a reminder for everybody, for all our CTAC webinars, we archive all the webinar recordings and we'll give you the website address, the direct address for all the Reimagining Children's Services webinar recordings and tools during the webinar. But you can also go to our homepage, ctacny.com for more information. And so we're going to get started. Uh, Dr. Mary McKay, Director of the Community Technical Assistance Center is logged on. I just want to um, make sure that we can hear her speak. Mary, are you on? I am, Lydia. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. So, so I'll go ahead with also my, my, um, my CTAC colleagues to, to begin to introduce um, our series and our speakers, if that's okay. And then I'll have you join me or uh, guide me in, in additional ways. So, hello everyone, I'm Mary McKay, and I have the real privilege of co-directing the Community Technical Assistance Center uh, of New York, and this is the second of, um, in, in a three-part series, uh, really focuses in on the children's service system and how we can think together uh, with New York State Office of Mental Health, with CTAC, and with you, around the transformed child mental health service system that takes exceptional care of young people and their families and also aligns with some of the new payment systems and opportunities that, that our system is, is presenting to us. So I have the real privilege of uh, identifying and welcoming our two speakers today. So Meredith Ray Labatt uh, is the Deputy Director of the Division of Integrated Community Services for Children and Families at New York State Office of Mental Health. I know Meredith very, very well. So thank you, Meredith, for being with us. And, and you're a real leader in really thinking through how do we provide excellent support and cares to, care to children and their families. And so I'm really looking forward to your remarks today. And then we have a real treat. Um, one of our CTAC faculty, uh, Dr. Anthony Salerno, who has taught me many, many things about presenting both in person and on webinars and has a real expertise in helping turn our attention to what matters in terms of quality care. Um, and so Tony will be the, the second speaker today. And so with that, I want to welcome Meredith and Tony, and I'm really looking forward to your webinar today. Meredith, before we get started, I just wanted to check in. Um, I think we're having some uh, minor technical difficulties. Um, if so for anyone who's attending the webinar, if you're hearing us okay, can you please send us a quick message in the chat box and click send to all panelists to just let us know that you are actually hearing everything that we're saying and that you're seeing the slides. 
Great. Okay. So I think that's so I think we're good. I think the technical issues have been resolved. So I, so Meredith, I'm sorry for the delay, but feel free to get started. No, I appreciate you checking in. We want to make sure that everybody can hear and can see the slides um, for today's presentation. So thank you. And thank you, Mary McKay, for that wonderful introduction and those really kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, and of course, it, always, it is a pleasure working with you as well um, all these years that we've had the opportunity to work together. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on today's webinar and welcome you to the second Reimagining Children's Mental Health Services webinar. Uh, the Office of Mental Health, in collaboration, of course, with the Community Technical Assistance Center, is committed to supporting providers through the upcoming various system changes occurring in the Children's Behavioral Health Care System in New York State. So with the help of CTAC, our goal is to provide you with ample and helpful information to assist you in preparing for, the eventual, uh, preparing for and for eventually implementing those changes throughout New York State. So for today's agenda, we really hope to provide you with practical and operational steps that your agency can take to, pre to prepare for these changes and to even help you to determine where to begin and where to focus your efforts. So as you'll see on the next slide, thank you. <laughs> um, today's agenda, we're gonna be uh, talking about the goal and aim of the redesign of the children's behavioral health system. We're gonna be looking at where we are now, where we wanna go, and how do we get there? And then we're gonna provide you with some opportunities to ask some questions of us. But first, we'd like to begin by gauging um, uh, where you are by asking you this poll question. So uh, the first reimagining webinar was by Donna Bradbury, who's our Associate Commissioner of the Children's Division here at the Office of Mental Health. And she did our first webinar, so we were hoping that you can share with us if you did in fact attend the first webinar uh, that took place about a month ago by Donna Bradbury. So you'll see up there is a poll question, if you can answer the question. Yes, no, or you don't know. So the poll should have popped up in that right-hand panel, and you can just click your response and hit submit at the bottom. And it'll just take a, a, a few seconds for us to collect some in, enough responses, and then we'll bring up the results. So the results should come up momentarily. Sometimes there's a slight delay. And there we go. So did you attend the first webinar? Um, it looks like uh, the majority of you said that you were able to attend. There's a few of you that didn't, and um, a few that didn't get a chance to respond. So um, we do have the first webinar uh, recording and slides posted on our ctechny.com website, and we'll share the URL that goes directly to that page um, in just a few slides. Great, thank you so much, Lydia. So, okay, great. <clears throat> so uh, on the last webinar, uh, Donna Bradbury really did a great job of highlighting all the research and statistics of what we know about children's mental health. So it really provided the foundation and the framework for the rationale about some of the design changes that we're uh, looking to make, but also providing us with a, a um, a groundwork, the, a common groundwork for really what are some of the challenges that we face within children's mental health and what are some of the opportunities or what are some of the things that we really want to change and improve uh, as we move forward. So um, we know that, that children are not identified early enough and we know that they also have trouble accessing the needed treatment that they need and they often struggle to get the services that they need when they need them. And so sometimes children uh, get into our system and they, uh, they progress with their challenges, uh, social emotional challenges, and by the time they're really identified or by the time their challenges are really unmanageable and impact their capacity to be successful in school, in their community, or in their home, uh, they often get, need high-end services and sometimes they'll need hospitalization. So we're really trying to avoid that by ensuring that we intervene earlier and that we are able to really maintain children at home with the support and services that they need and in the least restrictive setting in the community. Next slide. Great. So this is simply our goal, that children and their families receive the right services at the right time in the right amounts. And this is what we're basing the vision 
for our redesign efforts. So by capitalizing on our need for change, our move into Medicaid managed care, our development of health homes, we're really working to develop a design uh, to identify the services and the benefit package that will really help us to accomplish this goal. So by enhancing state plan services, making more state plan services available that will really address the social emotional needs of children, and by allowing earlier and greater access to a wider array of home and community-based services, we're hoping to better meet this collective vision for the right services at the right time in the right amount, not only for the Office of Mental Health, but for uh, children who struggle with substance use, children who are in the foster care system, and children who are also have significant um, medical needs as well. So, and what many times, as everyone knows, uh, the children in our system have often multiple challenges at the same time. So it, it, it behooves us to think about children as a whole and ensuring that all the services are aligned and available to them um, regardless of their challenges and sometimes their multiple challenges all at once. Next slide, thank you. So as you'll see, here's a visual depiction of uh, the, the service system, the continuum of care. And so our focus in the redesign is to really bolster this low level of services to help, again, with the earlier intervention, to help identify um, the challenges that children are engaging in, that our children are experiencing earlier on, um, so that we can move towards a more integrated care system and that the families and the children in need can access support services earlier on so that we avoid this uh, uh, this need for an intensive need of services. So, um, and by really bolstering the uh, array of home and community-based services, we can really make children have access to the types of services that they need earlier. So while this continuum often may be linear, each child's journey is unique and most often does not take a linear path. So our hope is to build a more nimble and responsive system that can better meet the needs of the children at any age of their development so they can move from a high intensity service or low intensity service and there be some fluidity between them, more so in the future system than really what our system allows today. So gearing up for change, where are we now? And I think to myself, that's not the only question I'm sure all of us have. I think that this change process really requires that we are constantly in a state of asking questions. So it's not only where are we now, it's, you know, where are we now, but where do we start? And then uh, when do we start? And what should we focus on? And who's responsible? And how, and who needs to be involved? These are all the questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, and there's many, many questions that we have in, in regards to all these changes that are happening. So. So how do we answer these questions? How ready are we? Um, and so the first step is really to gauge yourselves and, and your organizations, the organizations that you're in. You have to know what do you know, what you don't know. What do you do well? What don't you do well and what needs improvement? Who do you serve? What services do you provide? And what, are the, what may need changing? And then from that, where do you begin? And so there's lots of questions that you would likely want to ask yourself about this new environment that we're all moving towards. Do you understand the Medicaid managed care environment? What kind of infrastructure do you have within your organization that's ready to move into this environment? And what are some of the things that you need to bring to your organization to be able to function well in a managed care environment? How do you track how effective the services are that you provide today to be able to market and promote yourself in this new managed care environment? And how do we think about children differently as we move into things like health homes to think about kids holistically and all of the, all of the various needs that they may have, um, physical health, social services, mental health, all at once. These are all the questions that are coming to our minds as we start to think about these new changes that are upon us. Next slide. So in order to prepare for these changes, we're gonna be responsible for really looking at ourselves and our organizations and doing some mapping exercises to really get a sense of where we are today to be able to make changes for where we need to go for tomorrow. And the uh, CTAC has really helped us in that effort by developing a readiness assessment tool to assist providers in this journey and really determining what are the answers to all these questions so that providers can really start to map out 
the steps necessary that they'll take to prepare for Medicaid managed care. So to walk you through the readiness assessment tool, I'd like to, to turn this over to Lydia Franco from CTEC. Great, thank you, Meredith. So um, as, as Meredith just said, we, we, through the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center and through the, in, co in collaboration with the Community Technical Assistance Center, we've developed a managed care readiness assessment tool um, with an addendum really specific to assessing the child-serving service delivery model that you're currently utilizing. Um, and so for some of you, you may have, especially if you service adults, you may have already participated in a number of our MCTAC events um, where we've really been focusing on building managed care literacy. And some of you may have already completed the first part of the tool. Um, and those domains are, are what's listed here, understanding the MCO priorities, contracting, the credentialing process, uh, member services, uh, quality management, finance and billing, access requirements demonstrate. So that, that's really just more general managed care readiness. So we'll, we'll have that available and we'll be sending links to you as well to be able to complete that. But specific to the child serving system, it isn't just the transition to managed care, but it's also really understanding this new service array and what does that mean. And, and, and um, piggybacking what Meredith said is really understanding what are the types of services that we are already um, providing um, are any of the, the services in line with this new um, set of, of recommended services um, in the children's plan? And so we have this addendum, which is a, a part two. And essentially, it, it starts asking you to really kind of highlight what are um, the ways that your child serving programs do early identification and screening, screening of a client? What ways or what types of treatment models or evidence-based practices? Um, what are the models that you're currently using in child serving programs? How do you track um, child outcomes? Um, how do you, and whether those are standardized scales or ideographic scales, or how is it that you're actually tracking um, children's outcomes? Because we know a big part of the transition to managed care is really focusing on uh, um, achieving outcomes. And then the last one is really sort of the agency assessment for service array. So I'm just gonna pull up, um, just so you uh, have a look. So the part one is this managed care readiness assessment tool, and it's very um, detailed around a number of the domains as I had just mentioned. Um, so again, this may be familiar to some of you who may have already started completing it, especially if you're transitioning to adult services and participating in some of our events. And then specific to children, there is this other addendum that kind of asks some questions around participation in programs, um, the identification, the screening, um, if you don't see me um, moving the slides or scrolling, you have a scroll bar on the right-hand side that you can also move up and down. Or you can change the zoom as well if you're not seeing me kind of move the document around. And it's, it's just basically pretty straightforward, just highlighting what are some of the current services that you're providing. Um, and I'm going to see if I can rotate this quickly. Um, it's not the way that we wanted to rotate it. Um, and so there's a number of um, uh, programs that have been highlighted in the, in the state plan, as well as the home and community-based services plan that we've highlighted here. And just thinking through, are you already providing them? And if not, are you collaborating with any agencies that are? So we're recommending a, a certain set of stats and the URL ctacny.com slash child hyphen services .html, and we'll, the slides in the webinar recording will be posted on our website. Um, and we'll also be sending out an email announcement tomorrow so that you have all this information in one place as well. Um, so we highly recommend that you download the hard copy, the PDFs of both parts one and two, especially if you haven't had a chance to complete part one. Um, and really kind of sit down with key members of your leadership team um, to think through and, and complete the tool together. And then what we're asking um, for child serving agencies is to submit this online. So after you've completed the hard copy, um, to submit it online through an electronic survey form that we have. Um, and if you ideally can have that completed by January 30th, um, we can kind of get a really good picture around where child serving programs are and what additional resources and um, a programming technical assistance that we can provide to you as well. And then each agency will receive an individualized report of their responses that we'll be completing. And I just want to highlight that um, individual agency information will be kept confidential, strictly confidential. Um, we'll only be looking at information in aggregate. 
Um, and we also have some additional resources for part one through the mctac.org website um, that kind of walks you through in a little bit more detail if it's the first time you're really hearing about um, some of that managed care literacy programming that we've been doing. So again, all the webinar recording, the slides will be posted on the ctacny.com website. Um, the tools will also be posted there, the access to the online survey, and we'll follow up with an email to everybody so you have it all in one place. <clears throat> so to get us started, we just wanted to kind of check in with everybody and pull up a poll question. Um, and we just want you to let us know where you are with self-assessment. Have you already started implementing some form of self-assessment in your organization specific to this transition to managed care and the changes in kids' services? Um, so if you could let us know once that poll pops up, it'll pop up again on the right-hand side. Um, just let us know, yes, we've started, no, we haven't um, started yet, we haven't had a chance to complete them. We have been thinking about it, um, or, you know, what's a self-assessment? We haven't really thought about it at all. So in just momentarily, we'll pull up that poll. And maybe there's a technical glitch. So what we can do is if the poll, if you're not seeing the poll pop up, maybe you can submit it through the chat box. Where are you currently? Um, have you started doing any type of self-assessment, whether it's the tool that we have or another tool? or informal discussions or formal discussions? Have you, uh, have you really not been thinking about it yet? Or are you just not really sure where to start? Great, thank you so much. So we have a few people uh, writing in. Uh, and what, I, what I'm seeing is that quite a few are, have already started and are ahead of the game. Uh, quite a few of you are also saying that you're thinking about it. Um, many of you have said you filled out even our tool, at least a part one. So if you filled out part one, please make sure to fill out part two. And then there's a, a few of you that are, are letting us know that you haven't quite started yet. Um, so I think what we'll do is since so many of you responded through chat, we'll skip that polling function and we'll just move on with the slides right now. So now we're up to gearing up for change. Where do we want to go? And I'm gonna um, pass then that over to Tony Salerno to get started. So again, we'll skip that poll since everyone used the chat function, and we'll just move on to gearing up for change. Where do we want to go? Great. Thank, thanks so much, Lydia. Um, my name is Tony Salerno. Uh, I've been uh, with the Office of Mental Health for about 30 years, but I retired uh, about four years ago. Um, and uh, currently, I'm working with the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. Uh, it's also associated with the Silver School of Social Work, although I'm a psychologist by, uh, by training. And so, you know, when you're, you're thinking about a system that's undergoing some change, the big question is, so, you know, what am I supposed to do? Uh, how do I go about uh, preparing for this sort of change? And it isn't as if it's so crystal clear, right? And uh, that we know exactly what it's going to kind of like look at. And, and also you're currently working under, you know, current uh, regulations. So you, it isn't as if you can just kind of like stop everything you're doing and begin to sort of redesign. Uh, so. It, his, the, the focus for, for this part of the presentation is, so what's a smart thing to do? What's an organizational leadership to do? You've already heard, um, you know, Lydia go through some informational materials like a readiness assessment, both in terms of um, managed care readiness, as well as the types of clinical practices and knowledge of your organization um, and um, uh, the area of organizational mapping that you heard from Meredith. So certainly gaining information, getting as much knowledge about uh, what's going on with managed care, what's, what is the expectations around changes for uh, a child-serving system. So gathering information, of course, is a very, very smart thing to do. So coming on these webinars is, a, is, a, is, a, is certainly a smart thing to do, as well as utilizing all the tools that are being made available to you. But then there's also another, another level of, of preparation, and that's what I'm going to be going into. So the next slide. So some of the key question is, is having a vision uh, uh, for your organization and how it aligns with children's services and the issue around quality. And that's what I'm going to make a big pitch for, that it's hard to make a mistake if you focus on quality. So really the remaining part of this presentation is going to be on what the heck is quality and how do we go about, you know, sort of improving it. And especially so that it aligns with what is going to be a changing healthcare system uh, for kids and actually for adults and, and everyone else. We're just going undergoing a great deal of change. 
So next slide. So the aim of redesign, right, to improve quality, and when you already heard Meredith speaking about uh, some indicators are early identification, looking at outcomes, um, you know, the your whole service provision, uh, access, um, and that there's equity, right, that all children, regardless, regardless of payer, um, uh, has equal access. So I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail as well. Next slide. So what are the dimensions, you know, of, of quality? And it basically comes down to, to these areas. Uh, and, and it comes down to safety. Anything you do to improve safety in your organization, you are um, preparing for a changing healthcare situation. Uh, no matter what redesign um, goes on in New York State or en elsewhere, uh, that improving safety will be in support uh, and prepare you well for both managed care uh, relationship uh, as well as uh, redesign in the service system. Uh, effectiveness, being client-centered, uh, timeliness, efficiency, equity, the appropriate types of services, coordinated service, and accessibility. So these are some core dimensions. So what I'm going to go through essentially is, so what is it an organization, what is it that an organization can do uh, to increase uh, the quality along each one of those dimensions? So next slide. So when we talk about quality, I like this particular quote from Don Berwick, that the ultimate judge of the quality of the work that we do is those who we serve. End of story. And I think that is an important principle here. It can seem that, you know, it, quality is taking place at another level in the system. But actually, the, the whole point of all the different layers, regulatory, fiscal, um, redesign, uh, it's all to affect and improve the experience of those who are receiving services. So ultimately, they are the arbiters uh, of uh, what is really quality. So that's an important principle, and I think it's important to kind of keep in mind. Next slide. So Edward Deming, who is a big guy in the area of, of quality, uh, one of the gurus, uh, he made this statement, and I'm not sure if folks kind of agree with this or disagree with this, that the best way to reduce costs is to improve quality. Uh, and that's been proven over and over ago in a lot of industries, uh, that uh, poor quality is very wasteful. Uh, you end up not getting the outcomes that you want. You have to redo things over and over and over again. So this notion that somehow we can improve quality by throwing more money at an existing system, that that won't do it. Uh, and getting people to work a lot harder probably won't do it. Trying to get rid of like sort of the bad apples in an organization is not going to do it. And so that when we want to uh, look at and improve quality, it really does require a change in the current system. And so that's part of the catalyst for why things need to change. It isn't keep the same system, just get people to work harder, get rid of people who aren't doing a good job, and throw more money at it. Uh, that would actually be a simpler process. But as it turns out, quality is not going to be enhanced by that. Next slide. So the, and, and why is that? Uh, and, and this is a really important uh, sort of law. It's not even a principle. Those in the equality area kind of say, look, this is pretty much a law, that every system, the current system, right, is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results it gets. So if there is room for improvement, you're not going to get it unless there is a redesigned system. Next slide. The second law of, qual of quality improvement is to change the results, right, the outcomes that we currently get. You know, we, we need to really change the way the system, you know, operates. And it, the decision really is, you know, so what is it that we need to keep uh, doing in the current system that really aligns with quality? But there are some things that we may just have to stop doing. That's not so easy. We've formed organizational habits. We've developed systems, policies, procedures. Uh, trying to undo things that folks have come, become accustomed to is not no easy task. And that might be one of the biggest challenges is to stop doing things that have become rote or have become habitual in, 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 the, in organizations. And then the other piece, of course, is what do we need to start doing that we haven't been doing? And it's really, in a way, it kind of seems sort of like, you know, simple, and it is. But it's also very, very meaningful that ultimately that's really the challenge for us, what to keep, what to stop, and what to start doing. 
Next slide. So what's an organization to do, right? So that you're not wasting time, that you're not putting your effort into, um, uh, into activities that won't really pay off. So you focus on improving quality of your practices. And anything that you do to improve quality is going to be preparing yourself uh, to be in a better position, both in addressing redesign challenges as well as new fiscal systems uh, around uh, managed care. So you ask yourself, what can we do now? And it's difficult to waste time to make mistakes or to misalign your efforts if you focus on quality. So I hope I made this pitch strong enough. And I think it's a wise thing to do, a prudent thing to do, and a practical thing to do for organizations uh, who say, you know, we, we do want to be best prepared. Uh, we want to improve our services. And if you focus on that, which you can do beginning literally today, uh, then the message is that you'll be better prepared for a changing healthcare system. Next slide. So the question is, what can you do to increase safety? <clears throat> and that could be a conversation that any leader, anyone who's on the line right now in the next meeting can say, well, let's take a look at this. Let's step back a little bit, right? What is it that we can do to increase safety in the services we provide and how our programs, our procedures, our policies, our knowledge of the workforce, uh, all of those elements in an organization. And so uh, how do we increase safety? So if you have a process, you may want to look at having a process that quickly assesses risk of harm You're based on the child, family, and community factors. So that kind of attunement to uh, risk factors and being able to quickly assess those and have a response to that, you're going to be improving safety. And that will align very nicely with redesign systems and some of the emphasis of, uh, of managed care. <clears throat> so having a process to immediately respond to risk and crisis situations, uh, the more time that goes by, uh, the worse things can get. And the worse things can get, it, de it decreases or, or raises the risk around harm to self or to others. Increasing access to help when and where it is needed including school and home. So some of these efforts around home and community-based waiver is to really see if we can uh, kind of make a system much more flexible where people aren't so tethered to their, uh, to their offices or to the treatment setting. You know, I worked in adult services for a long time uh, and um, in, in, in clinic programs, partial hospitalization, and in many ways we often did feel that we were tied to our chairs in our office and into that setting. It wasn't designed for us to have the kind of flexibility that could be both uh, fiscally feasible uh, as well as being really practical and clinically useful. <clears throat> so those are some of the things to consider. So if, you, if your organization sits and has a conversation, you know, if, what's our, how, do we provide access? I'm going to go into a little bit more around the accessibility issue, but that also relates to safety. Um, do we impart knowledge to caregivers and others regarding resources and supports during crises? Do we prepare people for the possibility if things are getting out of hand, you know, how best to uh, address that? Or do people have to kind of figure it out while they're in the midst of some really difficult situation? So those efforts to prepare individuals, it's almost like a relapse prevention kind of like strategy or an advanced directive around how you want things to be handled. But having that discussion improves quality. Not having that discussion keeps the system the same. Having a process that provides options to relieve immediate crisis with the least restrictive setting. And in many ways, part of redesign is to see if we can address high levels of need with lower levels of, in, of intensity or restrictiveness in services. But that would require a redesign. It won't, it won't be done by just throwing more money at, at existing systems. Uh, so that whole part uh, piece of it is can we expand supports, the immediacy of, uh, of service response uh, in a way that even very high need uh, kids and caregivers, uh, that we can effectively assist them and manage the, uh, those situations with less restrictive interventions. Next slide. So how do we increase or what can we do to increase effectiveness? So if you have that conversation, uh, as, a, as a team, if you decide to choose that particular dimension. And again, it doesn't matter which dimension you choose. You can choose any of them. If you're working towards improving that quality along that dimension, 
then you are really preparing your, your organization really very well, uh, both to uh, improve the services you currently uh, provide, but also uh, what the future will hold. So do you identify best practices for a particular condition? Like, for example, um, the research is pretty strong that if you have kids with conduct problems, and again, it's the, the largest percentage of kids when they're referred for mental health services, uh, and you don't fully involve the caregiver, it's likely to be ineffective. So that would be just sort of a question. I mean, if you went back to your organization and you said, okay, how many kids here are being treated for conduct, some serious conduct problems? Oh, about uh, 32%. Of those 32%, how many do we have a caregiver uh, fully engaged, you know, in the treatment? And you may find that it really varies, uh, that, you know, some practitioners pretty comfortable with families, they engage them regularly, they're fully involved. Others, uh, it doesn't work that way. They're more likely to just see the child independent and don't, haven't developed a plan that fully integrates the role of a caregiver. So that's just one tiny example. But having that conversation around the effectiveness of services for the presenting problem, uh, and so any effort you do to improve that, you're doing well in terms of preparing for the future. Measurable outcomes. Uh, this is something uh, that Lydia mentioned. Some folks like to, you know, we use some standardized measures, right, some scale that's been validated and reliable. And ideographic idiog really means that it's uh, very specific to that person. Uh, so that someone wants to really improve uh, a particular behavior problem within the home that may not be captured by a standardized uh, scale. Uh, and so if you have increasing use of some of these measures, then if someone asks you, so what's the outcome here? Uh, how are you helping young people to get from a clinical to subclinical level that you'll have some basis of, uh, of making that determination? Then the staff training and supervision to ensure that practice are implemented, you know, with, uh, with quality. And that's a really big piece. So if you strengthen your supervisory uh, process uh, to assist and guide and support practitioners in learning some of the best practices to treat a particular condition, uh, then you're in the business of improving quality. And you'd also be in the business of preparing for the future. Next slide. Client-centered. So do the services align uh, with the expressed need of kids and their caregivers? One of the biggest ways to disengage a caregiver and a kid is uh, that somehow there's really a misalignment in expectations, uh, what the goals are, let's say, as the practitioner sees them, and what the goals are as, as for the young person and as for the caregiver. If that continues to be a misalignment, you are right for disengagement. And disengagement is... Um, basically one of the worst outcomes that you can have, both for managed care, which usually means if you disengage early, that means when you do come back to uh, services, it's oftentimes uh, those more intensive and more costly uh, services. So uh, uh, the alignment issue, adapting services, again, to align with the child and caregiver preferences, their strengths, their resources, and expectations. And that's really the art, right, of good clinical work, is to align and to, and to have a, a matching between the preferences, the needs, the, um, the lifestyle, the cultural uh, requirements, all of all these issues and how they align with like treatment. Misalignment means disengagement. And then exploring any barriers for the person getting fully involved in treatment. Next slide. Now we go to timeliness. And some of you might say, yeah, okay, that's the one we really want to like zero in on. So what does that mean? If you reduce time from referral to therapeutic contact, you have improved quality and you are preparing for the future. Avoid waiting lists or delaying of services. Uh, figuring out ways that you can engage people with having people on, uh, on hold. Uh, and that's a, that's a really important issue. The longer people wait, the more likely they are to disengage. Easy process for caregivers to contact uh, who, a helper, right, during uh, difficult times so that the response isn't like I have to wait two days to, to hear back from uh, someone in the clinic or whatever the program might be. So anything you do, to shorten that period of time where there's a more immediacy of response. And we all know that that's part of quality. We know that in any service that we're receiving, when we get a call back from our doctor when we're trying to reach him or her, uh, that makes like a big difference. That's what, that's what quality is about. You're preparing now and for the future. And a rapid response to crisis when it's needed. Next, uh, being efficient is pretty important. And to examine and improve your workflows uh, related to policies and procedures 
Now, what do you have to look out for? Most organizations don't actually sit down and take a formal look at, you know, how do we do business? You know, you kind of figure out a workflow and you just keep doing it over and over again. Uh, that certainly was true for me. I must, I must tell you, this is, this is just common practice in clinics that I was, um, you know, the director of and, uh, and partial hospitalization programs and an inpatient work. So I, I, you know, found this and, and it was very rare for us to just reflect on our workflows. Uh, and sometimes workflows create inefficiency because there's way too many steps. Every step is a place where something can fall down. It's just way overly complex. Uh, it's a mismatch between the task and the person's credentials, where folks at a higher credential are really doing work that is really outside of their, uh, their, their, their scope. And it's best to maximize a person's training and their experience and their credential. And then if there's any lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities. So if you were to sit down and take a look at an important workflow or intake process, uh, or uh, you know, what is our miss, how we handle when a person has a missed appointment or a no-show, you know, all of these sorts of things, when you look at that to improve its efficiencies, you're in the business of quality. To monitor missed appointments and no-shows that harm the bottom line and increase risk of disengagement. That's another area. And I know there are programs out there that are really taking a look, you know, at, at ways to uh, all, you know, sort of redesign uh, the whole process of scheduling, whether it's through centralized scheduling or using open access system. It's just the idea of missed appointments and no-shows are really, uh, it, it does, it's not, again, I don't want to, it's not someone to blame. It's saying that's poor quality. It's poor quality and it's not like who's, to, who's at fault or anything like that. It's just an indication that we need to take a look at that and do our very best to try to address it. If you do that, if you're in that business, you're in the business of quality and preparing for the future. And then striving for optimal treatment. And part of the, the problem is there can be an overuse of services. There really can be too much services. Uh, and that, of course, is, uh, is not very efficient. Um, and you could have uh, underuse of services and the idea of misuse of services, right? So the, the idea really is to, is to strive for optimal treatment. And that also involves, like, at what point do we feel that the person can go to a different level of care? What's the criteria that we're going to, going to use for that? How well do we do? When people do leave our services, how do they leave? What percentage leave because they just stopped coming? Which percentage leave because it just didn't seem like they were really appropriate for treatment? It was always more initiated on the part of the organization. Uh, so, you know, how do people leave because they just moved? They, they left the catchment area. How many, how many kids and caregivers actually complete a course of treatment that brings them from a clinical level that brings, brought them into treatment to begin with to being at a subclinical level where they no longer need this level of care. Doesn't mean they may not need it again in the future. But at this point in time, uh, the individual no longer needs this level of care that we're currently providing. And whether you begin to wean people, you know, coming in less frequently, and, but still having the focus on when you meet certain criteria, we know that that's time when a person has been at a subclinical level of functioning and it's time to move on. Um, to strive for optimal treatment, as I mentioned, and so those are efficiency issues, as well as effectiveness. Next, equity, providing care that does not vary in quality because of the client's characteristics, whether it's gender, ethnicity, geographic location, socioeconomic kind of like status. That's a really uh, tough issue. Not so easy to take a look at health disparities or service disparities. Uh, so if you take a look at that and say, well, is there, do we find that uh, that some folks, uh, whether it be by gender, ethnicity, uh, their socioeconomic level, somehow that's related to whether they make it to our services or not, whether they stay in treatment, whether we have, um, you know, effective, uh, you know, services. It's just kind of like taking a look, are the service sort of, are they equitable? Or have we designed them in, a, in such a way that maybe folks from a particular cultural background just don't find it that rewarding or not open to it or find it welcoming or misaligned with the sort of cultural perspectives and preferences. Not an easy thing to take a look at, but if you do, then you are in the business of quality. Uh, also care that does not vary illogically from practitioner to practitioner, uh, and that somehow we have standards of practice and it's provided by all as opposed to, well, the treatment is whatever that practitioner says the treatment is once they close their door. One likes to do it this way, another one likes to do it. What you have then is a system that can vary very illogically. You know, you get certain things if you ended up with one practitioner, you get a whole completely different approach with another practitioner. 
And so looking at standards of practice uh, that are applicable really across the board, they, at least that, that starts a, a strong basis of developing a service plan uh, when it's based on a combination of the evidence, the clinician's uh, knowledge and skills to engage individuals, and then the, the client's uh, particular preferences. So if you can bring those all together, that's really pretty powerful. And then supervision. Supervision is one of those areas that oftentimes has be, really been relegated to very many, to many administrative tasks or, you know, enforcing policies or overseeing productivity and documentation and those sorts of things. Um, but there may be an opportunity to take a look at supervision so that to ensure that there are some standards of practice that are applied uh, effectively across all uh, supervisees, right, across the staff that are being supervised. Okay, next slide. Appropriateness, so what can we do about that? Uh, really providing the least restrictive level of service to address the level of clinical need. And that, I think, is a guiding principle uh, in redesign, you know, as well. And to look at the service system that expands less restrictive services, right, of sufficient intensity and duration to address the level of need. So that's where we really get into the redesign of the current uh, service model to reduce the need for more restrictive care. And that's just something to kind of like, you know, to take a look at, uh, to see if that we are, is it being overdone, is it underdone, uh, is, is this service in a way being almost misused? So those, those issues around the appropriateness, you know, of, of, of services and especially trying to uh, address even high need with less restrictive, restrictive interventions. And again, we know that on the current situation, you know, that this, you have some constraints on you, right? That there are certain limitations, there are certain parameters that you have to work under. Again, it might be something you'd want to take a look at. The, the last part of appropriateness is do you make decisions to take into account the cultural, religious, socioeconomic, and other contextual factors, right, in the day-to-day -day experience of the child and caregivers, so that there's a certain flexibility, accommodation, uh, so there isn't a misalignment, and so that the, the service is really appropriate to the person's literacy level, comprehension level, cognitive level, uh, their um, the, the sort of existing and, and prevailing beliefs that the person has based upon either sort of cultural background or um, uh, based on some religious perspectives. It, that, you know, it just means that it's important to take that into account. And if you do that, then you're in the business of improving quality. Next slide. Coordination, increasingly a very, very important issue, not so easy to do. So the various community entities who are involved, right, because uh, you're not the only service provider or the entity in a community that may interact uh, with a, a child and a caregiver. Um, that is there a system in place to communicate information, to coordinate services, uh, to ensure that no one falls through the cracks? And those, some of those key uh, entities, of course, are school, foster care, primary care, juvenile justice. If you do anything to strengthen your partnership and relationship with any of these other community entities, you're in the business of quality. The risk associated with transition from one level of care to another is minimized, right, through coordination and fully engaged in, uh, you know, caregivers. So avoiding the kind of abrupt, poorly planned transitions where all of a sudden something has to change on a dime. So if things are really designed to be much more planful, uh, that uh, helps the coordination, uh, you know, process as well. But in many ways it really means knowing what your community resources are about, which ones your clients are likely to interact with, and then being able to establish a greater relationship and coordination of services in that way. Next slide. To make things more accessible is to reduce any barrier to treatment because of poorly designed organizational practices and policies. You know, how quickly can, is there someone to be on the end of the phone when you call in? Or if people leave messages, if they do, how long does it take for someone to get back to them? Those sorts of issues um, may really serve as barriers. Uh, and then increasing ease of access to services, right, whether you do open access kind of scheduling, just-in-time psychiatric support, immediate, having some immediate sort of response teams. There, there may be a number of ways, and some of them may be really practical under your current realities, uh, and that may become, offer you greater opportunities uh, under a redesigned uh, system of care. Next. Okay, so let's, let's just take a step back a little bit on a poll question. And so, when 
what way will a focus, if we focus on quality, be a useful approach to prepare for a redesigned system of care for children? So I've been making this pitch around that if you focus on quality and, the, and one or more dimensions of quality, that that is a useful approach to prepare for a redesigned uh, a system uh, or uh, in, in including a, a managed care uh, uh, system. Uh, so let's see if we can bring up that poll question. I'm really very curious to know what you guys, you know, think about that. So, okay. So if you can please just answer A, B, C, or D. Uh, do you think this is like a helpful way of thinking about it uh, in terms of what you can begin to do now or it's very helpful or it's helpful or it's marginally helpful or I don't know. I don't just don't think it's not, I don't think it's helpful. Um, so if you can just give us a little feedback on that, really appreciate it. Just give me a moment. We have a good number of folks on, so we take a couple of moments for people to respond. We want to get as much participation as possible. And just choose the one that makes the most sense to you. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we have a good number of folks who say it's a very helpful approach. Uh, I'm very pleased that, that you guys have found it helpful. Uh, 24 who say it's a helpful approach. And, well, it sounds like nobody thinks it's, it's not helpful. So I'm glad about that because I don't want to feel like we're wasting your time. And that marginally helpful, a few of you say you're not quite sure, right, that it's, it may be a little helpful, but, but it's only marginally so. Well, thanks very much for that, for that feedback. Um, and um, you know, we'll go on to the next to the next slide. So I, I'm I think that that's pretty good. Uh, and I, I you know I strongly believe that, that that's a, a good way to go. You won't make a mistake. You won't feel badly about putting your energy or you wasted time when you focus on quality. And I think that is an important issue. So uh, so thank you, Tony, very much. I think all of those Thanks. were really important uh, aspects of, of quality that um, is going to be helpful for people to think about as they move forward in these change efforts. So, um, you know, as we continue to gear up for change, how do we get there? So Tony just shared with you a, a lots of information, lots of different things that agencies, you know, should be paying attention to as they move forward into the managed care environment. Quality is very going to be very important um, as we think about <clears throat> How do we define ourselves? What do we say that we're good at? Why is it that uh, clients should come to us and receive services? <clears throat> Why is it that places should uh, be refer to us and and um, and use our services? And and why should why should managed care organizations contract with us? Why why are we good at what we do? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, a couple of things that uh, that are, are are critical as far as you know first steps in that vein. And as we move forward to the next slide. Is, um, is a couple of aspects, one of which is the critical role of leadership in this. You really, um, this starts at the top, uh, the need for leadership to really understand all the, the, the things that are important in regards to this whole change effort. What does this change effort mean? Um, and and what, are the, what does it mean for the organization to really be able to focus on those quality elements that Tony talked about? The role of workforce development, um, the people who actually do the services, that they are a, a key uh, population in making sure that this, this change effort happens and that it's implemented in a way that maintains that quality and assures that um, it is successful in, in whatever change implementation happens. And then, of course, how do we ensure quality on, in the long term? And so those are, the, those are the key elements of what we're going to talk about next. Move forward. Next slide. Thanks. So, you know, when we talk about the critical role of leadership, you know, one of the, one of the uh, key authors of, of change management and most well-known um, renowned change experts is John Cotter. And he, he talks about um, the eight steps uh, that leaders need to, change, to take to 
to assure successful implementation of change. Um, you know, he, he did, uh, in 2002, he developed, he wrote The Heart of Change, but he started his work back in 1995 with leading change. I mean, these, um, these eight steps have really been around for a long time, and they still resonate today because they really um, allow for leaders to, to map out what, what their role is in, in regards to change. And so, <clears throat> You know, he uh, he realized that you really, in order to to really facilitate change, you have to have a full understanding of what what is the change that's needed. Um, what is what is why are we why are we making this change? Um, what is the the purpose of the change? What's our vision for the change? And it's the responsibility of the leader to communicate the importance and the value and the purpose of this change to get the organizational buy-in and really increase the likelihood that that change will happen and it will be successful. And so, as you can see here, you know, he talks about building a sense of urgency and making sure that you're getting the vision right, that everybody has the same buy-in and everybody's working towards the same ends, um, that you're identifying key people that, you're gonna, that are gonna herald this change in your organization, and you're gonna empower action throughout the organization. Um, but you have to recognize that there are short-term wins that you could look towards and you could um, uh, be proud of uh, and that you need to have perseverance uh, in this change effort and that you have to continue to make sure that these changes stay and that they stick and that they continue on as, as you move forward. Um, so, you know, if uh, this is just a, a quick, you know, visual depiction of his content, you can feel free to, to, to look at that um, in your own research. But, you know, if we're thinking about like where we are, you know, we're, what we're talking about today in regards to that change effort, we move on to the next slide. Um, here's, you know, a common kind of, um, uh, you know, change process mapping, right? So um, these are these are generally common steps that that are identified for what's necessary in regards to making change happen. So in the change management strategy, and as you'll see, um, we started off our presentation really focusing on phase one that you need to do a self-assessment, a readiness assessment, even um, of where you are today in preparation for that for the change. And then, you know, part of what we talked about, you know, what Tony addressed and, and what we'll talk a little bit more about um, after this is really preparing for that change. So, you know, we're really in the very, very beginning stages of this change effort. And um, and so organizations really, uh, you know, have, have a long way to go. We all have a long way to go with how we can accomplish implementing uh, implementing this change. Part of that is really understanding, I think we're still also understanding what that change looks like, what that change means. and that. And information about that is going to come uh, even, even you know, past today into the future, you know, really getting more specific information about, about what this new design looks like and about the impact of what that might have on our system as a whole. And so there's a lot of work for us to do, and we really just started. So, um, so you know, engaging everybody in the importance of it, focusing everybody on quality, giving them some really practical steps of what we can look at now. What can we do now? in regards to this, these changes that are happening that could make us really prepare, even though we don't quite know what the, the, um, the specific changes will have to be in the system or will have to be in our organization, but what can we focus on now and what can we do today to prepare for that change? And I think that you could start that right away, um, which is really useful. Uh, next slide. So what are some of those steps for today, right? Um, how do you really take a proactive approach to the change? How do you kind of start before you start? <laughs> Since we're really in the very early phases of this process, you know, how do you, how do you build that sense of urgency as, as Cotter talked about? How do you get the vision right? How do you communicate that buy-in? Um, so you want to look at mobilizing the key leaders in your organization, starting to prepare your workforce to really understand that change is coming. Um, and having, giving them buy-in to the, to the focus of quality, about ensuring quality and, and um, promoting quality. It might be that your, uh, the stakeholders or the people who you provide services to are hearing about these changes and they're getting very anxious, they're getting very nervous. Everybody's very nervous. So it's the responsibility of the leadership to really communicate um, a, a shared vision and communicate a focus. And, and, and communicating a focus around quality is, is something that everybody can buy into. And so, you know, leaders must take that proactive, you know, open, transparent approach to change. And, um, and these are some of the steps that you can, if you have not, some of you may have, you know, started already, but if you haven't, certainly these are, these are helpful steps that you can start with uh, today. And so, um, um, helping to reassure 
everyone that is part of that organization or is served by that organization is, is a key a key part of, of the responsibility of, of leaders in, the, in this change process. So next slide. So of course, you know, to do that, um, to be able to communicate that vision and to uh, ensure a, a commitment to quality, leaders must ask themselves these questions. Do you, do you really understand the upcoming changes? Um, what does the vision and this new system design mean for your organization and the services you provide? How do you determine the impact of the changes? What changes might you may have to make within your organization? And then, of course, how do you prepare? How do you message? What's your messaging to the various stakeholders, uh, your board of directors, your employees, the pets, the people that you serve? And you might have to have different messaging based on your audience, right? You have, might, might need to, to tweak and to alter uh, what the message is for the different folks that you're really uh, engaging in this process. And that's, and that's appropriate and that's fine. So leaders have a big, a big job ahead of them um, and a lot of responsibility, but, um, but I think that, um, that there's things that people can start today and that there's ways in which um, agencies and, and the or leaders of those agencies can really uh, start reassuring people that, um, that uh, we'll, we'll all be doing this together. And of course, Office of Mental Health and CTAC are there with you and we'll, we'll support you as best we can in this process. Um, but there are things that people can do today. Next slide. Great. So there's another wonderful poll question. We like to make these interactive. So given that obviously communicating a shared vision or being able to assure that there's a commitment to quality or whatever um, the leaders of the organization have identified is what the area of focus is to be in this change process, what best describes your understanding of how the children's system of care will change? So if you can pick A or through D and press the submit button in the lower right hand corner. Right. So so basically you're being you're you're thinking about whether you definitely have a really good clear idea. You could go back to your organization and and really present to them and respond to a question, so what's going on? Uh, or you're mostly clear. You have enough, uh, but there's still areas that are really sort of gaps. Somewhat is you wouldn't you just don't have enough to be able to communicate to others and you, it's very unclear to you. So whatever one any one of those four options best fits your experience. So we'll be closing that out momentarily and the um, results will pop up. All right, it should be coming up in just a moment. Great. So um, what we have is uh, a number of folks really have a definite, uh, clear idea. Uh, and mostly clear was a large number uh, and somewhat clear. Um, and then there's a, a number of folks who really, you know, this is maybe this is the first webinar they've been on. And uh, it's, there's really a lot more that they need to learn. Uh, we all, you know, these webinars are also archived. So, we certainly recommend that folks go back to the first one uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to see it. And there was a good number of folks who are on this webinar who did not were not on the first one. So that may be, uh, you know, part of this as well. But okay, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Okay, Meredith, I think I'm on now. Yep. Okay, so uh, just a, another couple of comments around the uh, what leaders need to know the impact of change on the workforce. And, you know, folks who've studied this, like this guy Woodward, that it's uh, not unusual for the organization to believe it's, you know, involved in strategic change, but really the workforce can experience this as shock change. Next slide, please. And so what is it that staff are most concerned about? And the literature keeps pointing to this over and over again. Whenever there's a change process, right, and it's not even quite clear whether it's going to be a positive change or we're not sure or could be pros and cons, is the staff immediately are concerned about whether the meaning they derive in their work, that somehow they'll have to stop doing things that they really enjoyed and valued doing. That's a worry. 
That's a concern that staff will have. And in leadership engaging for buy-in, it's just important to be aware that that would be something on folks' mind, whether they articulate it or not. So to think about, you know, how you would address that issue. Uh, people are very concerned about the control they have in the workplace. They finally figured out a way to get through the day. They kind of like, you know, have, have kind of know their, their roles, their place, their responsibility, the environment, all of these sorts of things. And so control, whether it's going to be more work for folks, different kind of work, it's going to add more stress, more demand, those types of issues. The workforce is very concerned about that. And they're also concerned if their status in the organization will change, whether it's around their author current authority or their position in the organization. Is that going to be affected by a change that's going on in the system? So it's just something for leadership to be aware of uh, and to, to just validate and understand that it's not a deviation. You don't have like a resistant, very difficult workforce because folks are concerned about this. This has been found to be just a normal human reaction to a change taking place. Next slide. So workforce de development, um, this, this piece of combining education of the workforce uh, on uh, engagement and treatment best practices with supervision. I think that's the only point we, we, we want to make is that your, the role of a supervisor in helping and guiding um, uh, their organization, their team through change is really critically important. And sometimes that role is not acknowledged or recognized as such. Uh, so that that, and, and any, any opportunity, so the supervisors need to be as clear as possible. Uh, they need to be also given some of the time and the slack to be able to support their staff in, uh, you know, in sort of meeting some new demands and challenges. And then the other is, if you're going to be involved in, uh, so what should I do in terms of the workforce? Is there anything that I, any knowledge or skills uh, or information that the workforce ought to know to prepare for a changing uh, system? Uh, and uh, certainly they need to be as clear as possible about what the system is going to involve. But some of the core competencies that are going to be critically important uh, in a current system, but particularly important in a managed care type of like en environment, is those areas of engagement. Disengagement is really a problem. So any, anything that you increase the skill of your workforce on how to keep people in care, how to sh ensure that you don't misalign uh, your approach with the, with the client's expectations or comfort level is, um, any motivation enhancing approaches, uh, how to impart information so people know what the services are, what the goals are, ensure that those goals are not mismatched, basic problem solving, goal setting, advocacy, system resource knowledge and coordination, uh, areas around team collaboration, which I think is in, can become increasingly important uh, in a system that also wants to be more integrated. Uh, how to really develop a service plan, how to monitor progress and discharge planning, and, not, and also skills around, you know, what are the discharge criteria? What are the outcomes we're looking at? How are we monitoring those outcomes? All of those uh, areas of knowledge and skill, if you provide opportunities to support your workforce in developing it, you're going to be moving in a direction that will pay you well. That will align very nicely with managed care and also redesign system. Let's go on to the next slide, just in the interest of time. I just want to very quickly go through this, and is that, that some of these principles of quality improvement are really, can be very helpful when you're really setting on a mission to make some improvements. So you, you say, well, we want to improve this, but how do we go about doing it? And some of these principles may be useful to you. Next slide. So the idea of, um, you know, you have a problem uh, or something you want to improve, that's defined. I use this focused PDCA method, which is just a way to kind of keep the steps in mind. But organizing a team, I would say that's one of the most important decisions that you'll make. So who's going to work on this? If we're going to be looking at effectiveness or efficiency or safety or coordination, who, who do we put together to uh, take a look at it? Uh, how do we know, how do we currently do that? What's our current system? That's the clarify, right? It's clarify the knowledge of the process, right? So that we all kind of kind of know how it works. Understand where it like really varies, where it doesn't accomplish what we want. Understand what's the source of it. What's what's contributing to not being so, um, you know, not doing such a great job, let's say, or a job that we want to do around safety, or around coordination. What are the factors associated with that? And then selecting once you go through that process, it's, okay, let's let's think about it, trying something different. And it's like sort of like a, you know, your your test. Uh, your field test of an improvement, and then planning that out. Next slide, you're essentially, you know, and you've, I'm sure you've seen this, so this is nothing new about planning, 
uh, then, you know, actually implementing it and checking how it went. So that process still, I think, holds in how do you go about making an improvement focused on a particular dimension, you know, of quality. So I wanted to just share that with you. Next slide. Uh, so the idea of performance indicators. Now, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, and the things we hear from managed care organizations, that those organizations that have data that's really readily available, that they can answer some really important questions, uh, is going to uh, be uh, uh, prized by uh, or looked upon very favorably by managed care organizations and their expectations. And, uh, and you know, you want to be viewed as like a preferred provider, right, that you are recognized as providing quality services. And the way you demonstrate that to any payer is things like, do you know who you're serving? What are the distribution of the clinical problems? What type of services do we provide? How many clients actually go through a full dosage of treatment that results in a meeting discharge criteria? That means it really has gone well. How many drop out? Uh, what is the no-show, missed appointment rate? Uh, do, do we provide any of those evidence-informed uh, practices? Are, 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 is the workforce kind of knowledgeable about some of these, these approaches? Um, what, are, uh, what area of quality would be practical and feasible for us to address the aims to improve quality? So those sorts of like questions are like really, really important. Uh, and, they, and having data behind that is, is going to be increasingly uh, part of what third-party payers, any redesigned system is going to expect. And I know a lot of you recognize this and are working on that as well. Next slide. So the importance of the performance indicator, you just can't change what you can't measure, right, what you don't know. And it's hard to get others to change their behavior without data and information because everyone thinks they're doing pretty good. Uh, and with people's perception of quality and what the data suggests can sometimes be discrepant. Uh, so you can't just rely on how we think things are going. Uh, data helps to give us really more uh, in-depth information of how things are actually going. Next slide. So there are some tools. I'm going to go through this really very quickly. Next slide that you can use. Next slide. And I want to make a certain point. You know, how do folks begin to try to improve things? There's a very common approach, which is uh, we start improving things because of we see a deviation. So if you can take any of these indicators, what's our relapse rate, hospitalization, emergency visits, missed appointments, dropouts, program dissatisfaction, poor health outcomes, you know, we could probably make a whole big list. This one happens to be on the negative, right? So you want all the data to be low, but you could have had, we could have reversed this and made all positive types of like outcomes. But so your program is kind of going along, you have a certain rate of uh, missed appointments or hospitalization, whatever it might be, right? And, and then you just keep looking at it, and then all of a sudden something happens. You can just click the next slide. Okay. You start seeing a big increase. You start seeing a big increase. All of a sudden it gets everybody's attention. Oh, my goodness, what the heck is going on here? We've seen a huge increase in missed appointments or emergency visits or whatever it might be. So then that gets everybody uh, kind of alert, and it, it, it's urgency. And you start looking at it. Next, next. Now you study that problem. Next. And then what you do is you fix it. And you go back to where you were. So you've established like sort of a level of quality. We're kind of used to that level. And we just pretty much stick with it. And we only change it when something bad happens. And that's very, very common. It's almost part of like human nature uh, to kind of think that way. And organizations sometimes just reflect human nature on an organizational uh, scale. Next. Uh, next thing, another time you just you, you notice where you perform in relationship to other programs. That's the benchmarking. And if you're performing better, you congratulate yourself and you say, that's great. As long as we're doing better than that other organization. Even if that other organization has poor quality, at least we're not as bad as them. Uh, so you, one could, right? So that could be the benchmarking catalyst for improvement. Next slide. Sometimes uh, you can have it where your program is doing better or if your program is doing worse. Uh, so both of those can be a source of, if we're doing better, let's just keep doing it. If we're doing worse, it can get you excited. Unless you have other, other reasons for why you're doing worse, which could be like, well, our patients are different. You know, something's different about us. That's why we're not performing as well as, as others. Next slide. If you're really in the business of quality improvement and you want to be proactive, you don't want to just wait to see if things get worse. Then this is how 
a, 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 a continuous quality improvement perspective works. You're looking at this rate, but instead of waiting for something bad to happen, what you do is you study that process. Because really, we don't want anybody to go to the emergency room. We don't really want anyone to miss an appointment. We don't want anyone to be dissatisfied. And we don't want anyone to have poor health outcomes. So this is, this is an organization that says, we're gonna take a proactive approach. We're not gonna wait for deviation. We're not gonna compare ourselves to others. We have a mission of maximizing benefit to every client, every single one who comes to our organization. You study the process and that results in redesigning the process. And that's true for, in a way, how we were trying to redesign the system, right? It's kind of going, it has the results it has. Uh, if we want to change it, we're not gonna wait for like some horrible thing to happen or some terrible events or an implosion of quality. No, let's take a look at where we are now and let's see if we can redesign it so that we get actually better outcomes. Next. Workflow, I've already kind of mentioned to you about, uh, about that. Uh, it's something to take a look at. Uh, here are just some guiding principles around, you know, looking at the number of steps involved. And I've helped organizations uh, in some of my work I do in integrated care. Uh, and sometimes it's like you take a look at the workflow and you say, oh my God, we got like so many more steps than we know. Or if you find that three different people might be doing the same thing, so you say, well, who's responsible for that? Well, uh, sometimes it's Mary, and other times I think John does it, but if John's not here, then it's, and you get this very complex system of, um, you know, of workflow that lack of clarity on roles, uh, or if you look at the client, when they go through this workflow, you say, well, is that really a workflow I wanna go through? Somebody who I uh, care about? Is, is that really from the client's perspective, moving through this workflow, uh, is it something that's gonna be helpful or not? Uh, and then the customer focus, uh, you know, of course. Okay, next. So, um, recommended action steps. I'm gonna just, uh, turn it over to- uh, To Meredith. To Meredith. I think you're gonna kind of wrap us up and then move us on to the Q&A. Right, so um, I think that, you know, given the time frame, clearly these, these are the recommended action steps are really what we all talked about um, on the webinar, you know, throughout the, throughout the hour and a half. Uh, is, you know, Lydia had re recommended to people to please, you know, view the webinars that we had previously and certain, certainly register for the upcoming webinar in our, in our three-part series. Um, you know, look at all your leaders and your, the people who are going to be integral in implementing all the things that we've talked about today in regards to quality, in regards to leadership and vision, and in regards to data collection and ongoing quality assurance uh, mechanisms. Make sure that you complete that readiness tool and, um, and look at, again, look at all the content that we've shared with you today and, and then think about how you can implement it and how you can engage in operationalizing the steps for your agency and your organization. Great, and so we have a, a number of resources listed here for you on the website. They, as, uh, again, as Lydia mentioned early on, um, there's a lot of additional content on the website in regards to preparing for Medicaid managed care uh, that's been shared. So please be sure to look there if you've not done so already. Thank and you, Meredith. And our next webinar, thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight that we have a part three to this webinar series. And then part three is January 14th from 12 to 1.30, uh, specifically focusing on understanding the new menu of services. So it'll go into a little bit more detail about uh, the the, um, the some of the new home and community based services and, and service delivery models. So I want to be uh, mindful of time. We have a couple questions that came in. So Meredith and Tony, if you're open to taking a couple of the questions that come in, we can spend sure. uh, some time. If you haven't submitted your question, please go ahead and submit that through the chat box, um, and we'll make sure to to get the presenters to um, respond. And if we have too many that we can't get to in this time. Um, we'll try to see if we can do a follow-up and post that on our ctacny.com website. So the first uh, 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 comment slash question that came in is, is there a plan to address the issue of timeliness in relation to SCOA being the gatekeeper of services and providers not being able to be in direct line communication with referral sources, families, et cetera, until processed through SCOA? So that seems to attend to the issue of timeliness that we brought up. <clears throat> So, right, Mary, so that, like that's it? a great question. Yes, thank you. I think that would be, that's uh, probably a me question. Um, that's a great question, and I think that um, you know certainly I think that 
as we move into this kind of new world order, as I, as I keep calling it, um, you know, where SPOA fits and, and how SPOA relates is, is the question. A couple of things about, about that. Um, you know, as we move into Medicaid managed care, it's a behavioral health transition. So it's really not just um, children's mental health services. Obviously, we're, we're really, uh, this does include substance use. This does include, you know, foster care populations. This does include medically fragile populations. If we're really looking to kind of um, combine things in a way that it's more seamless and less siloed, uh, to think of something as, as kind of a mental health uh, gateway function, uh, it, it probably it won't be a good fit in, in the future. Um, but the, 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 the purpose of what SPOA does and the role of the county um, is really what, uh, what might continue to fit in the future. And so obviously as we move forward, there will be a need for us to have a mechanism, a, a place in which we do determine eligibility for home and community-based services. It's a requirement of CMS that we, we uh, use some sort of assessment or make some sort of official determination um, uh, that's not done by a provider entity, that there be a level of care determination, that they be eligible for meeting that level of care for, for HCBS services. Um, so, you know, where that, where that lies and who does that is, is obviously still outstanding. Um, but I think that the, the issue of timeliness is, is important because clearly as we move forward, there's, we don't, we can't wait. We can't, we can't have kids waiting on wait lists. That's one of the other things CMS uh, you know, has talked about is that um, if we if we allow for any willing and qualified provider to be able to provide services, there shouldn't be wait lists, right? So um, I think that there's a lot of things that we're going to need to look at about how our current service system is structured in regards to a lot of different things, um, uh, and 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 certainly I wouldn't call what we what we are going to be moving towards as being like a gateway system, but um, certainly there's going to be need to be an eligibility determination function. And then there's going to need to be early uh, quick access, uh, not only for hopefully the level of care population, which is our current waiver population, but also that level of need population who are really going to need that immediate entry into, into the array of HCBS services at a lower level, so that level of need population. So really we're going to have to rethink um, how that works and how that looks and how it also relates to being a cross-systems function versus just a children's mental health gateway function, which it is today. Wonderful. Thank sense. you, Meredith. Thank you. And we have a, a, another comment that came in that uh, was specific to some of the uh, slides on quality. I'm thinking that maybe what we need to do is think about moving from standard quality work to understanding what MCOs need. So I'm, I think I'm going to throw that to Tony. Yeah, no, that's absolutely a, a terrific comment. Uh, I think what, you know, in our encounters with, um, with third-party payers, with managed care organizations, uh, is that there is, uh, a, a, in many ways, a, an alliance between those quality indicators. Uh, just think of it, if you were a third-party payer, you want to have a contract, an arrangement with a provider who can effectively engage clients in care. That's, like, critically important. You want an organization where it's not wasteful, right, that they have efficient processes in place, that they know how to handle risk. Risk is one of the most critically important parts for any managed care organization, any third-party payer, uh, because if that's not uh, handled well, if the system does not respond well to early, the earliest signs of like risk, uh, then things are likely to get worse, which means uh, the, the, the care that will be provided is likely to be expensive, restrictive care. So uh, I think in almost all of those dimensions, you know, our, our read of it, and uh, we can see as, as that evolves over time, um, is that managed care expectations, uh, you know, around effective services, that things work, uh, that you know if it works, uh, is also aligned with just good practice and I think also good financial health. Uh, so I think there is, and, but I think that the comment really is, uh, is reinforcing and recommending that we make that more explicit and that there's an alignment with those quality indicators and the expectations around managed care. So I, I couldn't agree more. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So I'm just going to wrap us up with a couple remaining uh, comments. So um, just as a reminder, the webinar recording, the readiness tool, both part one and part two with the children's addendum will be posted on their ctechny.com website. 
Um, we will be sending out an email with all the information around the tool and accessing the videos as well as the uh, online survey for the tool in an email announcement that ideally will go out tomorrow. Um, we do have a feedback survey that's going to pop up at the end of the webinar. So for those of you, I've gotten some comments and feedback in the chat. If there's anything that you feel um, would be helpful in this process and in supporting you and, and becoming ready for this transition, especially all the changes in kids' services, if you can just fill out that feedback survey and let us know what it is that you're looking for, if there's any kind of specific um, uh, tools or resources or trainings that you think would be helpful for you, please let us know. Um, also, um, I just wanted to clarify that the readiness tool, again, it's a part one, which is the original managed care tool. So if you've been participating in our MCTAC events and you've already filled that out, you don't have to fill that out. You, but the addendum for children's services is new. So if you can go ahead and just complete part two and submit that to us, that would be really wonderful. And then we can combine sort of the, the, the reporting with the original managed care tool that you completed. If you haven't completed both of them, please do so. And again, we'll follow up with links and an email so you'll have all that information available to you. Or you can go now to ctechny.com. So I just uh, want to um, let everybody know that we have a list of recommended resources, the MRT website, the DOH uh, Health Homes website, and another really good a tool if you ha you're not on it already is the Children's Resources and Medicaid Managed Care Listserv. So you can um, sign up to be on that listserv and get the updates, um, the regular updates that are being sent out. So I just want to take a minute to thank both Tony and Meredith for participating in our webinar today. Again, please let us know if you have an additional feedback or recommendations. We have part three, January 14th, so please register for that. And um, thank you for participating and have a wonderful holiday.